Jesus first sends out the twelve in chapter 9 of Luke. And now he sends out the seventy in chapter 10. He's sending them out on a very important mission. But he's sending them without the kind of resources that you and I would want if we are to go on a mission like this. He says you're to have no purse, meaning no coin purse, no money. You are to have no bag, meaning no clothes or tools or supplies of any sort. And you are to have no sandals on your feet. This doesn't sound like they're going to be well prepared for the mission that is before them. But in order to understand what Jesus is saying to them, let's consider first what this set of instructions would mean for the disciples. If they don't have money, if they don't have tools with which to work, then they don't have the means to support themselves. So they're going to have to depend on the hospitality of those they encounter, the people in whose homes they will be welcomed for table fellowship. For those of us who tend to be a little bit bashful about evangelizing and sharing the good news, this set of instructions would really get our attention. You're not going to be able to eat if you don't share the good news from house to house. It also means that they're going to have to depend on what Christ is offering them and not on what they themselves have to offer. And he's given them some tremendous things. Power over demons. Power to exercise those who are possessed. Power over the demons that are believed to cause illness. The ability to heal. And the ability to offer peace to an entire household. For those who are encountering these disciples, they would have had to have been connected with something of the spirit of what they had to offer. John Wesley, our denomination's founder, talks about provenient grace. Before somebody professes Christ as Savior, grace is working with inside of us. And it stirs some kind of connection when we are encountering the Holy Spirit. The 70 disciples who are sent out are not only sent out without money, but they're also sent out without shoes. That means they not only are not the kind of people who could offer money to other people, they don't look like the kind of people who would have money to offer. They look like someone that we might see homeless on the sidewalk, speed up as we pass that person, and if we're thinking that person might be panhandling. There would have to be something within the spirit of what these disciples had to offer in order to make these people want to open their houses to them and bring them in for table fellowship. And what they have to offer is called peace. Peace in this sense goes beyond the way we use the word to define just an absence of fighting or conflict of any kind. The word in Greek is reina. In Hebrew, it is shalom. And it encompasses much more than just being without conflict. It involves wholeness, being complete, receiving something from God that fulfills who we are, that gives us that sense of confidence and tranquility in all of life's circumstances, no matter, no matter what life has to offer. That's the nature of the peace that's being offered to these people this shalom, this peace of Christ. Brian Mahan was my professor of psychology of religion, and he wrote a book entitled Forgetting Ourselves on Purpose, The Ethics of Ambition. And he talks in that book about psychologists that interview whistleblowers to understand better their motivation and their values. These whistleblowers are men and women who work for corporations or government agencies for very powerful institutions. And they witness something going on that was unjust, something that was illegal, some incident in which people were being harmed and it was being covered up, some incident in which something was being put out on the market that could endanger people's lives 
but it was swept under the rug in order to increase profits. These whistleblowers are people who had information that they released to the press and made the general public aware of that forced these institutions to address the injustice. And there was swift retaliation against all of them. They were fired. In some cases, they were blacklisted, making it difficult for them to find work anywhere else within the industry. In some cases, they were injured in on-the-job accidents that were set up in ways that looked suspicious. They were threatened with lawsuits. In some cases, the stress was so much in their home life, there were divorces or brokenness within the house. And psychologists were interviewing these whistleblowers, and they asked them, if you had this to do over again, knowing what you know now, Knowing what has happened to you, would you do anything differently? Would you just choose to look the other way and decide, well, I have family to care for. I'm just going to look for myself. Would you have just quietly resigned and gone to work for some other institution as well? And every one of the whistleblowers immediately said, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I would have done the exact thing I did before. That sense of conviction in doing what is right, even in light of losing so much, is akin to the peace that's talked about in this gospel message. The 70 disciples who gave up everything of their own offered one thing to the households they entered. Peace. The peace of Christ. A peace that once it is obtained, gives the recipient a tranquility and a confidence that makes bearable losing anything else or suffering hardship. <clears throat> Professing Christ as our Savior does not mean we have a life that is devoid of problems, but we have a peace. We have a confidence in who we are and what we are doing. It's what enabled those whistleblowers to look at the corruption in the institutions that they worked for, and to realize that those values were not their values. As the Gospel text said, they are citizens of heaven. Their name is written in heaven. And those who put their faith in earthly forms of corruption and greed are those who are placing their faith on Satan who falls from the heavens like lightning. The peace of Christ is what gives us the stability and the confidence to live the lives that we do, no matter what we encounter. It's something that makes bearable losing anything else in our lives, and it's what defines us more than anything else. That's what the 70 disciples offered to the families in whose homes they died. That's what those who invited the disciples to table fellowship received. And that is what Christ our host offers to us, that peace, when we come to the table this morning for the gifts of bread and wine. Amen.